Welcome to Ask the Tech Coach, brought to you by the TeacherCast Educational Network. If you are in charge of professional development and looking to build an innovative digital learning experience, this is the podcast for you. Join us each week as we uncover strategies that tech coaches are using to drive their digital transformations one classroom at a time. And now for your host, with over two decades of experience working with tech coaches and ed tech companies from all around the world, Jeff Bradbury. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us and making TeacherCast your home for professional development. This is Ask the Tech Coach podcast episode number 240, where today we're going to be talking about how you and your school district can create a district-wide vision for digital learning. This is a topic that has been passed around on a few different shows, and recently we had a chance to catch up with our good friend Nick Amaral, And he is here today to talk a little bit about how he and his district have created that vision and how you and your school district can create a plan to bring digital learning into the classrooms. If you guys are here for the first time, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. This is Ask the Tech Coach. You can find us, of course, on all of your favorite podcast players. Learn more about us over at askthetechcoach.com. And of course, on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you can just do a search for Ask the Tech Coach as part of the TeacherCast Educational Network. My guest today is certainly no stranger to Ask the Tech Coach podcast. He was my co-host for several, several great episodes, and he's currently a professional development specialist in North Jersey. I want to bring on my good friend, Mr. Nick Amaral. Nick, how are you today? Welcome back to Ask the Tech Coach. Hey, Jeff. Uh, It's great. I'm excited to be back and uh, just to chime in on the topic of, you know, professional development and learning um, and just share some of the things that I've been working on. uh, And that connects back to the topic that we're going to be talking about. Now, you have been a part of the, uh, you know, professional learning community for a while. Tell us a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing in your district in New Jersey. Yeah, so I uh, recently I've been working on a couple different projects um, that has just been just revamping professional development, and that's been one of my key focuses. You know, when I first took on my position, it was a lot of just how to meet teachers anytime, anywhere, um, taking a lot of the digital learning aspects of things we would do with students and applying that back to teachers and you know educators and their learning. So designing online learning modules and programs that's all self-paced, self-driven by the teachers. And the goal with that was to really kind of do a lot of micro learning so that teachers gain these background skills and knowledge through these online modules for set, per se, and then um, be able to meet with me through coaching and extended sessions like that to kind of extend the learning. So that's been a lot of the work that I've been doing recently in my district. And how successful do you see this type of learning I'm curious to know now that we're, you know, I hate saying the phrase post pandemic, but how has professional learning changed since we've all come back from the classroom, you know, 18 months ago? I I think that's a great question. And and I think that's, you know, for me, that's been a a pretty strong kind of focus point, because what I've noticed is that a lot of at least my teachers and I am going to guess this is probably a lot of educators everywhere is just you know, not having the time and just feeling worn out and tired. And do I have that energy in me to stay for an extra hour or two, you know, in the school day? And that's tough for a lot of people. So what I found, though, is that the work that I've been doing uh, to build like this online university and all these, I think I'm up to 75 or 80 plus modules probably now at this time, um, has really been quite a strong area for teachers to say, well, you know what, I can't stay. But the fact that I can go after hours or whenever I'm comfortable, even if it means after I put the kids down, has been strong. And I've noticed that that's been a a big piece now, especially like you said, kind of the idea of post COVID, um, you know, how is it being reflective in the professional learning experience for teachers? That's become a big thing. Now, today we're going to talk all about this concept of creating this shared vision. If you happen to check out our last episode, it was all about defining terms, defining terms such as innovation, technology integration, digital learning. And, you know, we had a chance last episode with Dr. Jim Beagley to talk a little bit about how do we 
really take that learning and adoption curve and start to build the process of flattening it. Before we get into this conversation today, Nick, do you as a professional development creator, provider, organizer, ever sit back and look at that curve and go, what teachers are our lead teachers? What teachers are our first followers? Who's on that curve? Who's all the way on that laggard? You know, that, 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 you know, you can't make me do it unless you make me do it kind of scale. <laughs> How do you plan to do all that stuff on a district level over the course of 10, 11, 12 months? How do you plan all that successfully? Well, it takes a lot of time. You know, I, I that's my summertime um, is a lot of that game planning. You know, I go through what I try to say is anywhere from two to four um, kind of assessments throughout the year. You know, those are my my annual breakdowns of, OK, where are we currently? What are our needs? You know, uh, let me get on the same page with any district admin that could be curriculum director, superintendent um tech director what are our needs and then being able to kind of go back to teachers what are specific needs that maybe individuals need or topics we need covered so the summer becomes my my game my get to work and and plan and and start to put things together um really map and diagram everything out on what i need to hit and then that's my goal is to like kind of what you're saying here is how do I get to build that catalog, right? I guess that's in essence what you're you're kind of getting at is how do you build the catalog that's going to hit on all of those goals, those objectives, and um, and that becomes a process here. And I think that's what we're ultimately. I think what we're going to start to talk about is that's how you start to build that shared vision and goal of what's needed from the top level down to you know teachers. And for me, that goes beyond teachers, by the way. You know, like for me, that goes into I work with administrative assistants, secretaries, nurses, what are their all real targeted needs as well? How do those conversations usually go? For many coaches that are out there, these are new conversations. Mm -hmm. These are scary topics. Um do you walk up to a secretary and say, hi, what do you need? Do you walk up and say, what are you working on? Or do you ask the building leader, what, what do you need your secretaries to do? And so that way kind and, of indirectly you have those conversations. Yeah. And I, th I think that's the way to kind of start it. You know, for me, I think key number one is, you know, what is, what's the purpose of the plan? You know, like that's how I usually sit down and start things. That's how I open those conversations with admin. You know, when we start talking about, okay, the visions and the goals, what's the purpose of, of what it, the target is of the objective, right? What do we want them to get out of it and why? Um, and that's an important question because then to me, it's all about the learning and what's happening in the experience back in the classroom. Okay. So how am I going to go ahead and provide you that experience, that training to get you to that point? Um, and then from there, um, once I've got that breakdown and kind of that high end discussion, then with, again, those, those executive admin, if we call them from there, it becomes, okay, well, how do I involve everyone? And that kind of now goes back to your next point, which was, do I go up to them and ask them? I survey them in different ways. Sometimes that's, you know, a real indirect Google form with a bunch of topics and things from kind of small discussions to those overarching goals, objectives that are going to match the vision and the goals that maybe the, the admin have set forth. And I try to pull bits and pieces from those um, to target real specific needs from tech tools that maybe I've dropped in to, you know, learner experience and outcomes for the classroom. So, yeah, it becomes a high level discussion to get those overarching big ideas but then from there, I'm able to say, OK, here's my goals. Here my, here's my objective. Here's the vision that we want set forth and how we're going to create it. Now, let me find all those minute little PD opportunities for educators, what their specific needs and goals are for their classroom and for their learning experiences. How are we going to now meet that? And that's what's now going to drive those professional development opportunities. Um, <clears throat> So you've had these conversations, you're, you're yep. writing down notes, you're, you're looking at the data from your Google form, you're putting all of this together. Lots it's still data. the summertime, <laughs> lots of yep. data. Um, yep. what's well, I'll be honest, next? let I mean, me jump at some in. Point, I, do you, you, you present this to your admin council? You take this to your upper, like at what yeah. point does the data from the mass, right? 
come to you, you figure it out, and eventually you got to push it back and you say, am I on the right spot? Is this, like at, at some point, your collection of their data needs to still come out to be their shared vision for what you're going to be doing to support them. Like, What's that back and yeah. forth look like after it's all kind of wrapping up? Yeah, you know, I, I'll, I will say I usually use the end of the school year to kind of get a quick assessment out there of what has worked well, things like that. Uh, what has worked well? What are things you want to continue to learn about and all of that? And I will say that's kind of important because although my admin like to take the summertime, the very beginning of it, to sit down with me and whomever and say, OK, what are our goals and objectives? What goals and objectives are we going to keep and et cetera? You know, what new ones are we going to implement? That gives me an, an opening discussion point to say, hey, you know, here's where teachers are currently at the end of this school year. Here's what they want to continue to learn. So pri before you start to think, let's get rid of all these goals and objectives and build new ones. I give them reasons why we want to continue on with the ones that we have or implement certain other things. So that gives you a nice jumping off point. I find that to be a little bit of a little trick when talking to them, like you're coming in with data to the initial discussion, and then you're going to go back and now get more data on, okay, now that I know what your specific goals and stuff are. Um, and then, as you said, once I get those targeted ideas, right, from staff, what are your needs again? What, what do you want to learn about? Um, I go back to the admin team and now we have another sit down discussion, usually the curriculum director and I um, in the past, it's been curriculum and superintendent. And then we just say, I say, here, let me let me show you what staff are thinking, feeling what kind of the ment mentality is going on in the district and, and where we are and maybe where they fall on these Likert scales of how they're going to write themselves in proficiency for certain types of really pedagogy and learning styles, right? So I bring that to the table and I prove my point on what I think. And then we come to a shared vision of usually for us, it's like three goals or objectives that are our focus area. And that's... We try, and, yep, we try not to keep it anymore. You know, I think once you inundate yourself with more than three, I mean, talk about the amount of PD, you know, when you start to break down how many different sessions could fit three big overarching umbrella ideas, it, it gets crazy. Well, what? Okay. So let's, let's take that down to the next thing, right? You know, your goals, you present it, your district yep. leadership says yes. Right. So now you take these three goals and you put them on those stone tablets and you come back down the mountain, right? <laughs> Do you at any point share all this with your teachers? Do they know these are the three professional development goals for the year? Or is it just sit down, you're going to be entertained for the next hour, and there's your faculty? Like, <laughs> where, where is that knowledge transfer? I see, this, yeah. I see this being a problem in a lot of school districts. Yeah, no, no, I got you. Yeah, so that becomes I, – I put together this document. I started a couple of years ago, uh, which – it's not an engaging name or anything like that, but it basically became like every year was our overview uh, to kick off the new year. So we'll just call it, you know, like professional development, you know, yearly overview. And that document I send out usually in the summertime once this has been established and I've had that discussion and we I know what those set goals, objectives and vision is going to be for the year for continuous years. Uh, and then I also map it out with ideas that I have as far as what professional development is going to come that's going to target those things. So I send that Google Doc out, you know, it gives again, gives a brief overview of here are the target areas that have been uh, chosen by the district or that we're gonna continue to progress on. And then I usually send that back out at the beginning of the school year uh, as a second time, because you know, not everyone's checking their, their email and stuff in, in, during the summer. Um, and that's why that way, then it's given me more time to build that catalog of, let's say, online learning modules and different professional development opportunities. But they see where all of those things are tagged. Now, for me, just so you know, kind of how it works on the back end for me, because I do a lot of the management stuff of it. You know, we use Frontline. I build all of the courses and the programs into that to, to design like a catalog, if you will, online. Frontline gives me the ability to build my goals and objectives in and then any courses that i create or workshops that i build into the catalog i tag then with the respective goal or objective that i'm trying to hit so by the end of the year it's also keeping tally on 
well, Nick, how many go, uh, workshops did you run that actually fulfilled the objective of blended learning, right? And then I can pull that data set and run how many people attended and how many workshops. So that's a nice thing as well. I, I'm glad that you're talking about it this way, because when we're looking at flattening that curve and we're looking at, you know, getting those unified visions, having that focus on not just internal professional development, but also the external, right? The yep. internal would be things like staff meetings or, uh, again, things that happen inside the district. We have a speaker coming in. We have uh, this consultant coming in. But I'm assuming a lot of that calendar says, here's an ed camp, here's an ISTE, here's an ASCD event, like all of that non-district stuff. I mm -hmm. would assume making those opportunities available to staff is important or do you shy away from that maybe for budget reasons? Because if you say, hey, there's an ISTE conference, now you're going to have 100 <laughs> people all applying for like, you know, little to no money or something like that. Like, do you have a balance gotcha. or is it your job just to say, here's every single PD opportunity that I can find all on a big calendar? No, there's so much out there. So I do invite teachers and staff to, you know, seek professional development outside. And a lot of times that's an added benefit to me as one person overseeing it. Um, and it's, it's hard for me to target a lot of specific needs. You know, my, I will, I'll be honest uh, and totally transparent. You know, I, I don't have a background in nursing and health. I don't have a background as a guidance counselor, right. Uh, or a therapist. So trying to target those professional needs for those groups is tough. So I use a lot of outside organizations or I partner with groups. Um, what I do, uh, you know, I send out a lot of weekly newsletters where I say, you know, um, here's what's upcoming just to keep people in tabs of like, hey, here's what's coming up in the following week as a professional development needs. And in there, if I know that there's something out of district that I think targets a few of the goals and objectives, I drop them into that, we'll say like newsletter or whatever it is that I send out. Um, but I invite it. I think that's a great opportunity. I think a lot of people like that. But like you said, that's the hard part. You know, I can't, how do I go to them and say, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm pushing this conference, which is great, but it happens to take place during the school day, you know? So we need 30, 40, 50 teachers to be able to go. They're going to look at me funny and go, that's, that's impossible. So, um, so I pick a lot of little things, you know, but I, it's, I've also, mm -hmm had great work partnering with a lot of organizations thrive and sage has been great to target a lot of like uh social emotional learning anxiety things like that they're a wonderful group um health organizations and hospitals in the area that i've partnered with that have are running like zoom sessions i reach out to them i go hey i like the session that you're running can my teachers attend it and then they send me the zoom link they're like absolutely so uh things like that you know, if you're trying to target some of those goals or objectives, especially those real finite things that are tough for you as a tech coach or, or PD person, that's the way to kind of implement that out of district stuff. Real quickly, you, you mentioned newsletters. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know a school district on the planet that isn't newslettered out, <laughs> right? Yep. Um, Super has one. The curricular has one. Digital learning has one. Every coach needs one. Your principal needs one. Uh, where do you fit in on this? I mean, you and I have had conversations even on this show of everything that you do as a coach or as a PD provider must go into meeting the goal of mm -hmm. the building leader. So if that is the case, your news should be included in their newsletter rather than you have your own flag that you're flying over here and they've got their own flag and they don't talk. What's your philosophy on newsletters real quick? Yeah. So, you know, real quick, I think the more that you can merge into less emails, the better, uh, because people just, like you said, they get emailed out. So I try my best. If I'm going to send an email out, I try to make sure that it incorporates other things. I have like a weekly thing. That's my PD. Here's what's coming up. Here's some out of district things. Here's a tech tip in there. Here's some news that maybe you want to know about. I started implementing uh, this new thing called like the good news in our newsletters just to help build culture and community. And all that starts to get built into that one newsletter again, because I want to send it one time. I don't want to send five different emails. Um, and I usually invite other 
admin and staff that, hey, you got anything you want to add here? You got something? I throw it into my newsletter and we send it out that way. Uh, so I'll be honest, I generally see maybe one newsletter a week, you know, if that two tops. All right, just because you brought it up, um, what's your platform? <laughs> Do you keep track of stats? Do you care about analytics? Um, g- give me the 30 second. How do you build? What are you looking for? And all that good for stuff. For newsletters? Everybody says, what are you using, right? So give us that answer. I go super easy. I use Gmail. I use the Gmail templates. Uh, oh. I built my own template in Gmail templates. I don't use too many analytics other than that. And then once I created the template, I saved it. Um, and now I just kind of regurgitate that template and start to plug in new information and set it to send every week or whenever I wanted to. That's it. Nothing fancy. I love that. Um, <laughs> I've just started looking at that now that I'm, I'm, I'm working in a Google based district and, and just yep. trying to learn how to put all that stuff. But, but if you're interested more about newsletters, we are going to do an entire newsletter episode coming up in a few weeks. So make sure that you guys hit that like, and subscribe button. We got a lot of great information on newsletters and how districts, coaches, instructional leaders can be using that. Let's shift a little bit from professional learning to more of that evaluation method. And Nick, I'm not talking today about your, you know, your beginning mid-year SLOs. I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at the evaluation of, you know, if you give a teacher a survey, like you said, and they want to learn about X, Y, and the principal walks in and says, are, are they seeing X, Y, right? How are you checking up to make sure that if a teacher says, I need help learning how to do this, that A, they're actually doing it, B, they're getting the support, and C, if none of those are working, how do we help move that staff member? Do we need to bring in a consultant? Do we need to bring in an instructional coach? Do we need to bring in tips and tricks from a newsletter? Because maybe they don't know how to do a self-graded quiz. Like, Sure. How can we help flatten this curve? How can we help move our district forward? How can we help create this culture for learning through? I I know this is teacher admin, Nick, but Mm -hmm. friendly evaluation methods where you come in and go, Hey, Nick, I noticed you're not, you know, like, how can I help you get this better? Do I need to find somebody? What's your thoughts on, you know, not the official evaluation, but you know, the soft evaluations. Yeah, yeah, I I think you just you have to have a variety of evaluation methods, you know, Um, this, you know, for me, this goes back to how I build my online learning modules. That's been a really strong piece. You mentioned something, Jeff, like, how do I know that the person can do it, though? Right. Like, it's one thing to learn content and have idea knowledge. You know, we say it with students all the time. Okay, yeah, they learned about a topic, but can they actually do something with it? So just know that like, well, that's been one of the keys for me. Like I, I built these online learning modules and one of the stipulations I have for all every module is there is an artifact creation. And that goes back to your point. Like, okay, I'm going to show you, I'm going to, you're going to watch a video clip or I'm going to have this online discussion and, and mine are very engaging. Like it's all about a collaborative space. It's, it's you and it could be you and a hundred other teachers who have all been going into the same module and posting and sharing and things like that. But in the end, after you've learned and shared and talked about things, you are going to have to spend an hour or two creating something that's going to show me that you know how to use that tool or integrate that pedagogy or pedagogical method or, you know, instruction uh, method of instruction in the classroom. So, you know, I'll give you a kind of an example here. I got a couple of teachers working on this idea of feedback for learning and they're and they're um, learning about John Hattie's practice of feedback and where it ranks kind of according to kind of like a, a scale of most effective things in the classroom. So they're learning about that. But then in the end, not only are they sharing their current practices, but they're going to now reevaluate their methods of evaluation in the classroom with students on giving feedback. And then they're going to create new opportunities to allow kids to either self-assess or, you know, whatever things that they're not using, they have to show me and create for me an artifact. So that's how I ultimately know. I then look at it and they share it with me. It is a lot of work on my end, but I go in, I look at it and I say, Hey, all right, did you struggle with anything? This looks great. Or here's an area where, I think you could use some extra help. So that has been 
a really big supplement for me where one, it's professional development for teachers. Two, it's done anytime, anywhere. But three, I'm also able to assess their skill. Um, I'm going to go back to my first point, though. That's one method, though, right? Like that's one method of evaluation. Now, the other method is having teachers self-assess themselves, you know, maybe informally on a Google form, you know, uh, assess, you know, a workshop session that you went into. What's another need that you have? You know, so things like that. That's how I generally I approach these evaluations of teachers and their skills or staff and their skills. How do we create this method so that way it is evaluation in one respect, but it's more, I don't even know the term I'm looking for. It's not the gotcha. It's not the slap on the wrist. It's not the, you know, if you don't, you're going to be put in PD jail. Like I I, I can't think of the term right now, but how do we make it more professional rather than punishment? Yeah, sure. It's, and and it's not as formal, I guess. Right. It's, there you go right? It's informal in the way that it's happening. And and I think that just goes with kind of the culture and brand that you end up building for your professional development, learning and development program, right? Like ultimately the program that you create is going to take on the persona of, of you, your personality and the things you put in. So, you know, if I'm building these online scenarios that are not one and done, like, like that's a big thing for me. I don't want my my learnings to be, you know, I want you to go watch this, answer a couple of questions. Next thing you know, create this. And hey, if I think that you're weak in it, there's the gotcha moment. And I'm going to go let supervisors know that so said teacher can't handle something. I don't want that. So I want it to be, you know, go through, test this out. I'll tell you, actually, some of the things in that same exact module that I mentioned for you, not only do they have to create a new assessment or feedback method according to some of the work that they learned from John Hattie, they have to implement it in the classroom. Sometimes I have them take pictures of things that they've created. I want them to also show me like it happening in the classroom. And then they have to do a reflection on it. So what worked? What was the student feedback? What were their feelings on what happened in the classroom? And then they bring that back to a big sharing collaborative share board. Sometimes it's Padlet. Sometimes it's an online discussion board. Uh, where all these teachers see all these other their colleagues responses and it becomes sort of that like that fire opportunity under them. So there's no gotcha moment. It's all learn from it. It's see what my colleagues are doing, take ideas from them uh, and know that in the background, I'm there to kind of support that and facilitate that. When we're looking at building these evaluation methods and, and maybe that's even the wrong term at these you know this informal support method yep it, it really is about keeping it consistent right you know having a principal walk into a classroom or even even district leadership like like you know in the roles that you're in walking into a classroom mm-hmm. should not be this oh my goodness quote they're here kind of a thing yep. it really should be a creating a culture where we're all here to support each other. You know, if, if a teacher's teaching and Nick, the district level PD person walks in, the, t- the, the teacher should come up and say, hey, I really could use this. Or, hey, could you help me out? Well, there should be that collaboration, but it's not just for teachers. You know, you and I have had great conversations about doing this for students and doing yeah. this for community members. I mean, what if at a board meeting you had a student tech team helping to do you know, basic computer sure. skills or showing off a coding demo, something like that to show off that, look, we're all here to support each other no matter what. I'm curious to know, what have you seen maybe in your district or mm-hmm. out of your district that really is a great example of how districts are supporting students in professional development, right? Not a lesson, right? Not a, not a lecture, but there is a difference, I think, between classroom and professional development, even in the student yeah. world, but also for community members. Yep. Yeah. So we, uh, you know, one of the things I saw done really well uh, a handful of years ago was um, a, a district not f- too far from us uh, in Jersey, but they created like a student run genius bar, right? Like modeled after Apple's genius bar. Uh, and this was a handful of years ago. And I think you started to see these pop up in a couple different districts and whatnot. So we met with them. We liked what they were doing. We, you know, we ended up implementing uh, a student run genius bar, which kind of took a little bit of a <laughs> hiatus with COVID and whatnot. And we're working on kind of bringing that back. But one of the things we ended up doing right before COVID, uh, which was working out really well, was 
I worked with our media specialist and one of our tech guys, uh, IT guys who helped that group. And we actually had the students from the G- that student run Genius Bar um, run professional development sessions, which was pretty cool. Uh, and a lot of teachers would intend, uh, attend. So I would basically go to the tech group and I would say, hey, guys uh, and girls, um, hey, here's a bunch of topics that the teachers expressed need for. Here's an example. I always get teachers when it comes to tech tools asking about iMovie and GarageBand. Always. Like I can't tell you every year it comes up over and over and over again. And students are really, really good with iMovie and and GarageBand. So I go to them and those are things where I'm like, do I really want to run another session on GarageBand and iMovie? But now I could use the student run tech team to run that session. So that becomes a fun thing. So we did that a few times. Um, It worked out really, really well. Um, With community, that's another thing. You take advantage of those students uh, to run some community things. I've, I've actually now I've run to just training sessions with board members, you know, when board members, this was, this actually came up recently, uh, new board members, um, come on. A lot of them had no knowledge about Google, like nothing. They don't, they don't use it in their professional or personal life. So them now in this, as a board member, now having to share documents and, and use Google drive and things like that was new. So I've run sessions like that with them. Um, a lot of times that's just during the day they pop in and I know ahead of time and, and, uh, we set up time to meet. Um, and then I share with them a folder of stuff, but I think that's a great thing. You know, that's not only just support for, for the students and getting in as a tech coach, but utilizing the students to now support teachers and community members along the way. What does that look like, right? It's easy to get a bunch of kids together who are interested. I'm assuming at some point you're teaching them how to teach, right? There's there's that component too that has to happen. Yep. Yeah. I, I, you know, w- when we did this, I usually, you know, I keep them relatively short. I like to leave a lot of time for, you know, more Q and a with the kids, but I have the kids put together. I, I, I tell them it's like they're teaching a lesson in the class. So when we did this um, a couple times prior to COVID, it was think about like, you're going to teach a lesson to a group of students in the class. These students are teachers. They're new to this program give me a lesson plan, start to create. So we give them time where like these groups meet, you know, this tech group meets and um, they form what students are going to cover, which topics, because we have different, you know, if we have 10 or 15 kids, five, take one topic, five, take another, that sort of deal. Um, And then I walk them through some of the basics of, Hey, here's what I want you to keep in mind. Right. And my go-to things when I'm working with kids is give like 10 minutes of direct instruction talk to them about the app, give them an example, walk them through how to do it because treat it like they have no clue whatsoever about it. And then you got to give time for people to play and you're going to walk around and kind of facilitate that. So that's like my go-to real kind of easy workshop model for students who have never done this before. Um, And then they get comfortable with that and they start to implement that same method, you know, for future sessions. I I would imagine when you have students who are, I hate this term, tech oriented, (laughs) right? Making sure that the work they're doing in the classroom, making sure that the work you're kind of encouraging them to do outside of the classroom is all buttoned down. You know, we're talking specifically Mm -hmm. about student privacy, digital safety. Um, You're, you're teaching a kid how to fix a Chromebook. Next thing you know, they're at home ripping up their, you know, their parents' (laughs) computer, right? Talk to us about the importance of, really you know, digital say and, and again there is a difference we're going to talk about this over the next couple of weeks of s- digital safety digital literacy digital security all the digital terms but right now let's just kind of dive into student privacy H- how do we help build a vision that includes teaching those same students about right versus wrong or how to protect themselves and others So, you know, we've uh, gone ahead and implemented, you know, a lot of digital citizenship stuff into the training that happens. That's been big. Um, A lot of kind of our um, science and math uh, teachers and, and those who do the coding and STEM type labs, they do that as implemented units in our curriculum. A lot of that was written in. Um, in the past couple of years to make sure that that was a honed in part that they want, you know, teachers to focus on. Um, 
So that's been one of the ways that we've kind of been able to hit the skills and ideas of what is a digital citizen? What does it mean to, you know, to maintain privacy? How do we do that, though? You know, that's a whole nother question, because one of the things I did was how do we show face as well? that we're also doing these things that we're promoting the kids to be mindful of, right? Like, so one of the things I ended up putting together was a dashboard. I created this dashboard in like a Google Sites meets (laughs) Google Sheets. It was a bunch of different apps. And basically what it became was this site page that has a spreadsheet of all of the tools that we use in our district. And, and, And I would tell any district that isn't doing this, I'd say this is a pretty good thing to have just in case you get these questions that pop up, you know, so said student uses a tool that, you know, the parents, when they graduate, the parents find out that there's videos or pictures of things that they created and they want that content, right? Like that happens with a lot of these apps. So I created this dashboard. The dashboard is all the tools we have in the district attached to that is every tools privacy policy with the link to it. And it's on a public site page as well so that parents can see it. I also say whether or not for teacher purposes, it's a paid or premium program, or if it's just the tool that maybe so a group of teachers use, I think there's a difference between those as well. Um, But what that does is that becomes a vetting process. So, you know, if a teacher wants a new app in the classroom, they submit a Google form or they pull me aside and we talk about it. I I create the Google form for them. So there becomes a process to it. Um, But then I vet everything and I go through the process. Okay. Is, is it approved? Are there any issues? What's their privacy policy? What if I ever need to remove student data um, from that? What's their policy on that? Because some sites will even tell you like, Oh, the parent needs to email us and ask us to remove it. So I have a lot of that stuff written out for parents, for our teachers and whatnot. And it's just, again, just the data dashboard of the tools and their safety and all of that just to maintain kind of the privacy aspect for the district. I think that is a fantastic tool. And is that something that you said that's something that's public, right? I mean, would you be able to yeah. share that link in the show notes so that way we can put that out there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I have that. I can share that. And yeah, whoever takes a look and take a look at what we have. I've seen a couple districts do similar things. Again, nothing fancy. Google site, Google spreadsheet. It's it's a couple different things together. But um, I think highly valuable, especially especially the younger grades as well, because you're trying to monitor a lot of those tools. I I love that you're doing all of this work to support not only your students and your staff, but your parents. And one of the things that I know a lot of school districts have done, we had an opportunity in my previous district to do this. I can say previous district now is (laughs) to create a learning opportunity for parents. Right. And these learning opportunities could be short, like a parent night, you know, come out once and done. You bring somebody, they do a little, you know, uh, program. Or they could be full-blown things like a parent university where you have an ongoing curriculum, lots of information. I think including parents, as you mentioned, is absolutely vital in changing the culture of a district, right? And you mentioned this. We're using Mm -hmm. these applications. Parents might not know about them, might not be realizing that student information is out there. How do we, you know, harness the, the interest, how do we harness the fear? How do we harness uh, the knowledge that we're putting out there or not putting out there? Getting parents involved, it's no different than you do at like a, a college night, right? You get all the parents mm-hmm. together and you talk about the FAFSA and you talk about the money and you talk about the college. Yeah. Why not do that on the curricular side and you make a night of it, right? Everybody comes and we're going to talk about STEM education or character mm-hmm. education or something but why not do a series of that and why not really involve that community? And again, that is professional development for the community. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think that's a great idea. Now I, you know, thinking about what you're saying, it's got my head, you know, kind of spinning on, okay, ideas. Um, we don't do that as far as, you know, this kind of 
community professional development. I love that as far as, you know, like a whole series of things that you build out for the community. I think your parent university, that that's a really cool idea. Um, one of the things we did that works out rather well um, was on like our back to school nights, we build in uh, parent sessions and I'm sure a lot of schools do it right. You build in like the Naviance and the FAFSA stuff. Like you said, that's all in there. I usually run a session with one of my, my network administrator, him and I, and we tag team and do uh, like our learning management system, Google and Genesis, the student information system. And we tackle those and we're available. And I'll tell you, we usually get a good decent number of parents that come out and they're like, Hey, I know I'm using this or I know my kids are using this. I have no idea how to use Google. So right. can you walk me through some of the basics? So that's been a great night. I could see that totally develop into more of like these, this parent series or community series. And these are not difficult, right? These are also no. great ways to get your staff involved. When I was first tasked uh, three years ago or so with creating our first parent university for my district, you know, I got all our coaches together. I got all our LMSs together. Those were the, you know, the teachers. Um, I found some teachers that were, you know, now that I know this pre administrators, and they were looking to get their, their, you know, their head out there. They were looking to build a name for themselves and build their brands and stuff. All of this came about because we said we want to help our district at the time. This is early 2020, I guess now, um, learning about how to help their student at home. Right. This was going to be remember, this is the year that everybody was going to be home. So <laughs> right. how do we create a learning environment for parents? So that way they under they understand Google and classroom and searching and LMSs and all that other good stuff. Well, you get your content specialists out there. You don't make it an entire curriculum of Google, but you talk about how do you help in reading? How do you help in math? How do you help in, mm -hmm. in multilingual? How do you, and we, we had it translated. We, I mean, every single zoom session, we had it in English with a Spanish translator and we, we recorded it. We put it up on a big Google site. We had a whole calendar, we did it to the best of our ability to get the thing off the ground. And it was absolutely fantastic. And it doesn't have to stop there. A true parent night or a true parent university could be a community member teaching the parents. You know, if you have a, you know, the, the local, maybe somebody on the, on the school board or whatever is, is, a, is a lawyer. Great. Have them do the session on how to fill out the FAFSA. Right? right. Maybe somebody has a as a student in a particular college, have that person come out and give a conversation sure. about yep. college hopping and, and co you know, get people involved in the community is I think where I'm going with this. No, yeah, I totally agree. You know, not to not to get too crazy into into the, into the weeds of things. But I think if we start to think about a lot of the issues Sur surrounding a lot of districts and schools and and communities i think so much of that is this sort of stuff where if we can start to revamp sort of that culture not just the culture of the building itself now the culture of the community itself uh where everyone's kind of helping each other and all voices are heard now i think that's a pretty cool uh experience of what can come out of that you know like you said having a couple parents uh, come and show face and lead a session on something with students or with teachers or whatever, just making their their knowledge available because they have it in a key area. That's a really, really powerful piece. You know, when we're looking about how do we create this district vision, how do we start to build the building blocks to what is going to become a culture shift? We've really hit a lot of different pieces here, Nick. We talked about developing that shared vision and goals. We've talked about prioritizing the professional learning both in and out of our districts. We've talked about creating that evaluation method. We've talked about providing constant support for teachers, students, and community members, protecting students' privacy through digital safety, working with parents. And I want to wrap up today really with that, well, where do you start? And for me, I feel like the first place to start is by celebrating those little things, right? If a teacher, no matter where they are on that curve, does something great, does something small, 
give them a little tchotchke, give them a little sticker, acknowledge them, put them in a newsletter. Hey, Nick's doing this great lesson. Go ask him about it. Or maybe, you know, if you're an instructional coach, maybe every month you do, you know, the digital learning rockstar program, something like that, that is going to celebrate the work that's happening in the classroom and give them a little push, give them a little high, you know, a, a, a digital high five, if you will. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for anybody out there listening to this that's looking to figure out a way to celebrate that doesn't involve food? <laughs> that's always one of the go-tos, right? Food or no, prizes. No donuts on this one. No <laughs> cat bars, right? Like Starbucks you know, gift cards. Yeah, yeah I got right, you. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. And because and, that always, you know, you see this all the time. The coach goes to said donut shop and brings back. Well, I'm never going to suggest that an incentive program be taken out of a coach's sure. paycheck, right? Yep. No, I, I think, hey, to go back to your point, uh, that has always been one of the big pieces for me. And I think for a lot of us, if you're you're a tech coach, you're in professional development, learning and development, you do it in schools and you do it in the corporate world. Like it doesn't matter. Like those, when you're in that role, so much of it is because you're there to facilitate someone else's learning and development, right? And what better than that, especially now with educators, than to share their wins, right? So one of the things I always tell my teachers and, and when I speak to admin and, and I do the things and just districts that I talk to about like the professional development programs, I always say success breeds success. That's sort of like my thing. And I think of that as like, listen, if people see that, right, you kind of like that initial fire and they see that it's working for other people, then that gives them more ownership of the idea that they can do it too. Uh, so find ways to share that. So uh, my, I'll give you a quick couple little things that I do. One, I'm constantly posting either on Twitter or in those any of those newsletters. I use those as opportunities to say, here's an example of what someone did. So here was a win. Hey, so-and-so teacher did this cool virtual reality thing in their classroom. I just wanted to share it with their students to learn about this topic. So now here's the thing they did. Here's the classroom uh, and here's what they learned. So they could see like, oh, I could apply that too. That sounds really cool. Um, posting it. So and so teacher created something using Canva. Great for the first time, whatever. And I post it around. I put that in the newsletter. I put that on Twitter. So, so much of your job should just be the promotion part. Um, and people like to see that. And then once they do that, get those people, man, get those people to present to your teachers in the district. Like, hey, you created something. That was an awesome win. Why don't you run a session now and really share your voice and what you did in the classroom? So now they're not hearing it just from you. They're hearing it from their colleague, too. And those who haven't seen but heard it now get to sit and, and actually experience it. Those become some major wins. Talk to me about the success of that. I, I've recently in, in my coaching program, you know, you, you're working with a teacher, you're excited, they're excited. And then you say, hey, Nick, can you share that at the next thing? And they go, oh, no. How, <laughs> how do you encourage somebody who's still, I don't know how this is going to come out, still in their shell? Yeah, I, it's uh, a lot of times it's me going and getting that information. Um, but again, this is things like you got to think, outside the box a little bit. If I go back to my, my, my online modules, right? Like I go back to the module. I've told you, I've basically almost watched you through all my module. My modules now become right. Okay. Learn about it. Do this, interact with colleagues, create something, right? That's a big piece to it. Create and show me the skill reflect on it. So what I didn't tell you is that after two years of doing that, I said to myself, how does it get back to students and the learning in the classroom and sharing their success, which is what we're talking about right now, right? Like celebrate the success and what it has on students and other teachers and whatever. So I have them go and implement that in the classroom. I have them take pictures. A lot of those things are like these bonus challenges. Take a picture of the using the thing you created in the classroom with students. Oh, you learned about WordPress? Take a picture of your kids creating WordPress uh, blogs or websites and share that with me. So that becomes part of the professional development, we'll say ev informal evaluation. Uh, but then I'm able to take those pictures 
And all those things that they've shared, the Canva file example, the pictures of the kids in the classroom. And then all I'm doing with that is I'm turning around and promoting that in the district and outside the district. And that's where they're like, oh, they're, they don't even know that they're internally doing what they're doing. But now I'm taking that information. I'm going, all I'm doing is just sharing the work that you're sharing with me and putting it out there for other people to see. And then they go, wow, you know, like, thank you for, for doing that and for sharing my voice and, and, and being able to kind of go above and beyond. And they, and they love it. We want to know what you think about all this, right? Because we're going to be working on these types of topics over the next few weeks. Next week, we're actually going to be looking at how do you take all the stuff we've discussed today, but you include standards. We're going to talk all about the ISTE standards. We're going to talk all about the future ready framework. We're going to figure out how we can merge these goals, these visions, and these little pieces, right? The digital safety, the community, the working with the evaluation process. How do we add our standards that way we are shifting the culture, not just forward, but forward through the use of these standards. And it doesn't matter if these are digital learning standards, science standards, math standards, whatever. We're talking over the next few weeks about how do we build a culture for learning? digital learning, regular, you know, in-classroom learning, community learning, doing all of this stuff together, but we can't do this alone. I would love to ask you what your thoughts are on this topic. If you'd like to be a guest on any of these future episodes, we would love to have you. If you'd like to find us online, you can, of course, tweet to us at Ask the Tech Coach. And if you want to be a part of our professional learning communities, you can always go over to askthetechcoach.com. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and you can join us on Facebook, on LinkedIn, or on our new sites over at k12leaders.com. We have so many great professional learning opportunities for you, the instructional coach and digital learning leader. We hope you guys find these shows in, in informative and share them with your friends and colleagues. Nick, I want to say thank you so much for not only coming back on the show, but really this is the work that you're doing. And I, you know, we've been do talking about this for goodness, almost, you know, eight, nine years at this point. And I love the fact that every time we discuss this, there's new things going on. You're always building, you're always innovating. You're always taking that professional seat and figuring out how can you share it. And as you're doing in your own district, you're building that culture where professional learning is the way to quote the Mandalorian to move that needle forward. Where can we go to find out more information about the work you're doing and maybe check out some of those great resources. Absolutely, Jeff. As always, I appreciate it. So thank you. Uh, and hopefully I won't be a stranger till the next time. And uh, you guys can follow the work that I'm doing. Reach out to me on Twitter at nameraledu or find me on LinkedIn. I've actually been posting a lot of stuff on there and just examples and and some posts and things to help you out. And that wraps up this episode of Ask the Tech Coach, episode number 240. How do you create a district-wide vision for digital learning? I hope we've answered some of those questions for you, and I hope if you have other questions, you reach out to us. On behalf of Nick and everybody here in the TeacherCast Educational Network, my name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you guys to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students. You've been listening to Ask the Tech Coach, hosted by Jeff Bradbury of the TeacherCast Educational Network. Please reach out to the show with all of your questions on Twitter at Ask the Tech Coach or online at www.askthetechcoach.com. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. And please take a moment to write a review in the App Store.